And I want to read the first seven verses of Acts chapter 19. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost, any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? That would be a pertinent question, I would think. And they said, Unto John's baptism. And then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on, laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. The question that Paul puts to these Ephesian disciples, disciples of John, has been the source of much discussion, even controversy. What is this question about? What is he really asking them? One question that arises is whether or not they were truly Christ's own disciples at this point. To what were they baptized if they didn't know that there was a Holy Spirit who's the one that convicts of sin. He is the one that directs us to Christ. He's the one that enables us to believe on Christ. If the Holy Spirit is not calling, uh, then what, what, were, what, were the, what was the reason for their baptism? Why, was the, why were they baptized? And now we know that the Holy Spirit came, was sent on the day of Pentecost. We've been looking at that on Wednesday evenings. And he came according to the prophecy that was given. And everything that took place on that day was um, an amazing um, demonstration of the power of God and the power of the gospel. And the wonderful things that took place on the day of Pentecost. And many have said, well, what we have here in Acts chapter 19 is the second Pentecost. Some say it is third Pentecost. There was another at, uh, in Acts chapter 10, and now this. Well, I do believe that as Paul lays hands on them eventually, and they receive the same signs that were given on the day of Pentecost, that there is some credence to that. But still it begs the question, what is this question about? What he's, is he really asking them? More recent, uh, uh, the question has been, more recently, uh, I'd say in the last 140, 150 years, um, it concerning the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that they had been saved by grace and now they need to be get the second blessing and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so that is the view of some, that's what they believe is being inquired of here by the apostle. But this question, gets down to the real uh, crux of the matter concerning our salvation, the salvation of anybody. And to me, this is the way I want to consider it tonight. This question gets down to the nitty gritty. He did not say, have you believed? He did not ask, how came about your believing? His question was one which when answered, would clarify both of those things. It would clarify whether or not they had believed. It would clarify how they came to believe, the answer to this question. So this question is one that we do well to ask ourselves. I believe in the sense that it is meant, it's a question that believers do well to ask. Not that we are doubting our salvation or anything, but is there evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Are the fruit of the Spirit being demonstrated in our lives? 
Do we have the leading of the Spirit in our lives? Do we have the comforter in our lives? Is He directing us? Is He guiding us into truth? He's the Spirit of truth. So have I received the Holy Ghost since I believed? Since I say that I believe, do I have the evidence of the Holy Spirit? Now, when I believe, did, did the Holy Spirit come into my heart? When I did believe, did he come into my heart and into my life? Is there evidence of his presence and his influence in my life? I think that is a pertinent question. Whatever, however Paul meant the question, whatever he is asking, we can put all the controversies away, all the arguments away. What I'm, the way I'm approaching this tonight, it is pertinent and it does make sense and it's a question that we can put to ourselves. Now some might argue that's not what he is asking here. Well, if that's not it, and as they might say, it had to do with those times from Pentecost until that time, then it has nothing to do with us, if that's all it is. And I prefer to deal with, with the question that pertains to us today, which regardless of what the apostle had in mind, is the question. That's the question of the hour. You know that in the early church, apostolic times, the Holy Ghost manifested gifts and signs. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, we see that he did. If the gifts of healing and prophesying and working miracles were still given today, I'm sure no believer would hesitate to put himself to this inquiry. But surely those gifts, which are permanent, we know they're permanent. They're the, those gifts that are of greater value. Paul did say, I show you a more excellent way. I show you something far better. If that, if the permanent gifts greater value than the temporary gifts. And God's usual order in all things is to save the best wine to last. And I believe in this case, this is true. But we have the quickening, we have the comforting, we have the enlightening, we have the interpreting, we have the hearing, we have the witness. All of these the Holy Spirit does. This is his office work. It's what he does in us. And also whether one bears the fruit of the Spirit in his life, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, goodness, temperance, all of these, are these being born in the life? If they're not, then it would, Paul might come to you or me and say, have you received the Holy Spirit? You say you believe. Well, have you received the Holy Spirit? Where, where is the love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, long-suffering, temperance? Where are those things in your life? Did I receive the Holy Spirit when I believed? Am I receiving the Holy Spirit now that I have believed? Or am I receiving the Holy Spirit as I am believing? is another way of this, the understanding of the text. So the question is a vital question. He is the author of spiritual life. The Holy Spirit is the author of life. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh doesn't profit anything, but the spirit quickens. The spirit gives life. So if I don't have the Holy Spirit, I don't have life. Did I receive the Holy Spirit when I believed or was my believing an empty exercise? Life doesn't lie latent 
in a natural man waiting for him to stir it up. That's the way some speak of man's nature and the effect of the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not that way. There is no spark of life in there that he needs to fan it into a flame and get it going, turn it into a blaze. No, we're without life. If the Holy Ghost did not impart a new life to you, your believing was a dead believing, and the same is true with me. All religious activities are formal and dead. That which is born of flesh is flesh, Jesus said. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit, born of the Spirit, with life from above, into God's family divine. Now here is the, the question which ought to be part of the, the part to, uh, it should be put to the convert, this latter day easy believism that we, uh, that we witness all the time, and it didn't just start yesterday, it's been going on for a long time, perhaps the last half century, it's, and as I said the other day, I, I read where one of these well-known um, modern day evangelicals, very well-known, said, yes, I preach easy believism, and I'm proud that I do. Easy believism. We know what that is. That is getting people to believe, getting people to respond to anything and make a decision and say a prayer and then pronounce them saved. Whether they understand anything of the gospel, whether they know they're a sinner, you just tell them to say they're sorry. I found that when godly sorrow works repentance, you don't have to coax somebody to say they're sorry. When the Holy Spirit does it, then it's real. But here is the question which ought to be put to the converts of this latter day easy believism. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? You made a decision, you said a prayer, the personal worker told you you're saved now, and don't ever doubt it. You got baptized, but did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? The Holy Spirit is also the author of instruction, that is true instruction. Men minister to the ear. It's all we can do. We're happy to do that, glad to take the gospel and, and broadcast it and declare it and proclaim it. But if my voice is all you hear, there's not going to be anything lasting come out of it, no lasting good. But if you hear the voice of the Spirit in the preaching of the gospel, then that's something else. That's what matters, that God speaks in the Word that the Holy Spirit speaks in the Word. The Spirit alone can engrave the truth upon the fleshly tables of the heart. And one of the texts that was dealt with tonight in the doctrine class, that, that very thing, how that God puts His Spirit in us, how that God puts His law in us, and how that He enables us to walk in it and to keep his statutes and do his judgments. And how is it done with a whip? No, he's written that law in the fleshy tables of the heart so that there is a love for that law. We do not consider the commandments grievous anymore, but we delight to keep them. And it's not that we keep them perfectly, that's certainly true. But I believe that every true child of God his heart desires to keep every known commandment and to abstain from every known sin. Do we? No. 
But that would be the heart desire. That would be what the heart would want to do. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's done a work in the heart. He's in the heart. And the law of God's been written in the heart. That is the new covenant blessing. I will put my law in their inward parts. And you'll not have to say, know the Lord, because they shall all know, know me from the least to the greatest. I've written my law in them. But this is the Spirit's work. He does this. And thus, for life and understanding, the Holy, the Holy Spirit is a vital necessity. I say this, is, this question is a vital one. He is the transformer of the character. You must be born, Jesus said. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. You must be in order to have eternal life. You must be born of the water and of the Spirit. If any man be in Christ, the scripture says he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new or are becoming new. He's been made new. The one who works this transformation is the Holy Spirit. No man can transform himself. Job asked the question centuries ago, can a can any bring a clean thing out of an unclean? And then he answered his question, not one, not a single one. If the fountain is unclean, the water is going to be unclean. If the fountain head is polluted, the whole stream is polluted. And you can't bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing, not in the spiritual. That's what Job is saying. He answers his own question, not one. Not one can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can renew the mind. Can you change your desires? We talked about that this morning. We have been given now. We've been brought in to union with Christ. And we now are partakers of the divine nature in this sense that we have new inclinations, different than what they were before. We have new desires, different than they were before. The things that we once loved, we no longer love. The things we once hated, we now love. Can you change your heart like that? Can I do that? Is there anybody that can just decide to do that? I hear sometimes people talk about repentance as though that's just as easy as falling off a log. Well, it's not. As a matter of fact, if God doesn't give us repentance, and that's the way Paul words it in his letter to Timothy, unless he gives us repentance, we'll never repent. Unless he grants us faith, we will never believe. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. That is, faith is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So we can't change our hearts. We can't change our desires. We can't change our inclinations. We received in the fall this sinful Adamic nature, and it is always downward. It is never lifting itself up. So we need someone to lift us up. We need someone to transform us. And that is the Holy Spirit. That's his work. Did I receive the Holy Spirit when I believed? Has my nature been transformed? Do I now love the Lord? Love his word, love his people. We can know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. That's one of the tests we can put ourselves to. Do we love the people of God? Well, that's a good proof that you have life, that you've passed from death into life, that the Holy Spirit has transformed you. If in believing your nature did not undergo a radical change, 
which is evidenced by the changed life, then it's nothing more than presumption. It's not faith at all. Something else, the Holy Ghost is the sanctifier. It's another of his works. He's the author of sanctification, a faith that does not pine for purity and does not pant after God is indeed a counterfeit, Mr. Spurgeon said. And he took that a little further and he said, a faith that is not purifying is putrefying. That's a pretty strong statement, but I believe Mr. Spurgeon is right. <clears throat> faith that does not <clears throat> pine for purity and pant after God is a counterfeit. So did I receive the Holy Spirit when I believed? But how can a man follow holiness except by the spirit of holiness? A holy man is God's workmanship. We, we read that, that just as he gave us faith to believe and we're saved by grace, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to what? to good works because God has before ordained that we should walk in them. God works according to his decrees <clears throat> as we learned tonight in doctrine class. One thing he decreed is that we would walk in holiness. That we as being created anew that we would uh, experience this transformation and he has created us unto good works. He has foreordained that we should walk in them. But we don't just one day start walking in good works. What happens? We have to be regenerated. We have to be transformed by the Spirit of God. We have to have the Spirit of God living in us. And then we walk in good works. The Holy Ghost is the author of prayer. He is truly the author of true prayer. The psalmist David said, When thou saidest unto me, Seek ye my face, then my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. I'm going to tell you whether we understand it, whether we believe it or not, that is the truth always. He initiates true prayer. The Holy Spirit has to do that. And we follow his lead in prayer because the Holy Ghost is the author of all true prayer. And of course, prayer is the true sign of the new birth. When Ananias was afraid to go near Saul of Tarsus, all that had to be said to make the point that's not the same Saul of Tarsus. He's not the same anymore. What was the difference? What was the proof? Behold, he prayeth. He's praying. Now Paul had said many prayers in his life, but he was praying. He was truly praying and the Holy Spirit was helping him in prayer. That was proof that he was a child of God and that he was no danger to the church anymore. No danger to Ananias. Prayer is impossible apart from the inward working of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself prayeth for us. He intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And I believe he always does that. I don't believe it's some special sound that is being made in our prayers or any sound that's coming through our, from our tongues at all. I believe it's the Holy Spirit praying as we are praying, helping us in our prayers, and his groanings that he prays are heard before the throne of God because he is the author of prayer. He is the one that works prayer in us. This is his special work. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. 
but he does and he helps us and I'm sure he gives us words he gives us a heart to pray he helps us in our petitioning but he goes beyond anything we can speak with his own groanings on our behalf now where is where this question is not vital it may still be of great importance let me tell you what I mean by that even where you wouldn't consider this a vital thing what we're talking about now is vital I mean this is life this is uh, sanctification this is his instruction this is prayer all these things that show the vitality of life the Holy Spirit is the author of all of these things so if we have received the Holy Spirit these things are going to be realities in our lives but even where this question is not vital it's still of great importance some people always want to ask well is it essential is, is this or that essential to salvation? Do I have to do this to get to heaven? Or is it mandatory? As though they would be saved at the cheapest, in the cheapest possible way. Cost them the least that it can possibly cost. What a miserable profession that is. Especially when we see what the Holy Spirit can do for us what he wills to do in the believer. What if God was asking these, these professions, these professors, are you enjoying the wonderful benefits of the Holy Spirit? What, what if Paul, if that, what if that's what he had in mind when he put this question, have you received the Holy Spirit? I'm not saying that's what he's saying, but what if he were? What if he were saying, are you enjoying the wonderful benefits of the Holy Spirit now that you believed? It would be a legitimate question. What are some of those benefits? Well, he's the comforter. The Holy Spirit is the blessed paraclete. He comforts our souls. He is the one that can comfort us in our times of trial. He's the one that can comfort us in our times of tribulation. He can comfort us when we're going through the deepest sorrows, just with his presence, and bringing us to some precious text of Scripture, or by leading some believer to us at just the right time. The Holy Spirit comforts, and he is, that's his name. If I go away, I will send you another comforter, Jesus said. Well, Jesus was a great comfort to those disciples. They were with him every day, and he had just told them that he's going away. If I go away, um, and they are wondering, well, uh, and of course, Thomas asked the question, well, you we don't know where you're going. How, how can we know the way? All these things going through their mind. And the one that was the comfort of their souls is leaving. And he said, I will send you another comforter. <clears throat> He'll be with you forever. He will abide with you forever. But if he's the comforter, why frown, why grumble, why complain when he can make our heart glad? And none can make the heart glad like the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit of enlightenment. Why go around saying, well, I just can't understand that. I can't understand the Bible. <laughs> if you're a believer, if you tr truly know the Lord, and you want to know the scriptures, who is the author of the scripture? The Holy Spirit. He lives in you. Can he not bring you into that truth? Can he not give you understanding? We're glad for teachers. We're glad for preachers. We're glad for those that can explain to us scriptures. But I'll tell you what, as a preacher, I come across scriptures that I need somebody to explain to me. Now, who does that? Well, I can go to maybe preachers smarter than me, but I can also go to the Holy Spirit. He can, he can give this understanding 
where we might remain in confusion otherwise. But he is the one that enlightens us. He will lead you into all truth, but he probably will not do that by osmosis. He's not going to do that through the cover of your Bible while it's there on the shelf. No, he will guide you into all truth while you apply yourself to study and to seek to know the Word of God. From the day the Lord saved me, and I would have to actually say before, even before the time that I felt the Lord had truly saved me, I truly wanted to understand the scriptures. I wanted to know them. But after the Lord had saved me, I had a desire to study and to learn. And the Holy Spirit from day one, he is the one that opens the understanding, enlightens the heart, sheds light on the truth. And who better because he's the one who gave it. And we've said many times when you come to dealing with some of the difficult prophecies of the Old Testament, and you hear all kinds of uh, wild ideas as to what this means and when it's to be fulfilled. So many times, if you will allow it, the Holy Spirit himself has explained it through the New Testament apostles, through the writings of the New Testament, perhaps through the words of Christ or Paul or Peter or others. And we do not have to remain in the dark or questioning what does this mean because the scripture itself explains it. Well, that's the Holy Spirit explaining himself. And he can do this with any text of scripture. And I'm so thankful that he does. He's the spirit of liberty. This is a great blessing that he is the spirit of liberty. He has removed the veil from our hearts so that we are now led into truth. We've not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And this is all by the Holy Spirit. He is the great spirit of liberty. He sets us free from bondage. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, that's where we see that he's removed the veil from us. And the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. And as we saw this morning, that's not a liberty to sin. That is a liberty to grow in grace and to go from glory to glory advancing in faith and in grace by the Holy Spirit. What a liberating spirit he is, setting us free and opening up new horizons to us that we had never, never dreamed possible. He is that spirit of liberty. He can set us free from our sins. He can give us strength over them. Well, I've just tried and tried to give up this or do that. Well, why not let him try it? Why not let the Holy Spirit try it? The wind blows where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. And as you know, wind and spirit are the same word in the Greek and in the Hebrew. The Spirit blows where it listeth. You can't tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth, but you hear the sound, the evidence is there. Let, let him do it. Turn it over to him, he'll give you strength. And he's a spirit of direction into the service of the Lord. This is the way, walk you in it, is what the Spirit of God tells us. He's the one that moves us by holy impulse. It's God that worketh in us, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. I had a, an aunt that believed in work salvation, and 
She was always, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And period. That was the end of it. But she never went on to the next verse. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We can do no good thing without the Spirit of God working in us. And that is exactly what he does. And then he also empowers. Does any man know what the Spirit of God might make of him? I know that D.L. Moody once said, maybe more than once said, that the world is yet to see what God can do through one man totally given to him, totally dedicated to him. And I'm sure the world is still waiting to see what can be done. But he went on to say what I think is the heart of any believer, I want to be that man. I would love to be that man. Completely yielded to the Holy Spirit to see what he might do with me. How much uh, divine power has never been tapped. I believe that the greatest, the ablest, the most holy men of God might have been greater and abler and more faithful and more holy if he has put himself more completely under the control of the Holy Spirit at the Spirit's disposal. Now these uh, blessings are answerable to the second rendering that I gave of the text. Are you receiving the Holy Ghost since you're believing? Since you believe. How about us? Are we? This question can certainly be answered. Some doubt that it can be known. But in uh, some, the question is needful. The perpetual pessimism that some people live in, the muckraking and the grumbling that occupies most of the time of other people, worldliness, selfishness. When the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, it's needful to ask this question, the question that Paul asked, have I received the Holy Spirit since I believed? Is he evident in my life? Well, if he is, then certainly it's going to change my countenance. It's going to show up in my attitude. It's going to show up in whether I'm a constant pessimist or if I think positively. And I'm not Norman Vincent Peale. I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking. I'm talking about thinking as the Holy Spirit empowers us and trusting in His power and what He can do. Why should we be pessimistic? Why should we not be optimistic? Is there anything too hard for Him? Now the, in other words, this question in other people, this uh, question is needless. They're enjoying the earnest of heaven. They are eating the sweet grapes of Eskel all the time. Five minutes in their presence and you know that they know the Lord, they love the Lord. It just shows up in their face, it shows up in their countenance, it shows up in the way they speak. And their general outlook and attitude toward life, and especially their love for Christ and the people of God and the church and things holy, you're around them a while and you know they have the Holy Spirit. You don't question that they have received the Holy Spirit. He lives in them. Now there's some lessons to be learned from this question. Assurance of salvation is not to come from one's act of faith. It's not past history. I don't know how many times, and I'm sure it's been true with you, that people have uh, gone back to some event in their history in the past, and that's where they go to find the assurance 
of their salvation. Yeah, I, I, I remember the time when I prayed and I asked God to come into my heart and, and others were around me and they prayed for me and all these things. And I remember that event, so surely I must be saved. A true assurance doesn't come from history, what's happened in the past. True assurance comes from the present. Salvation is not past history, it's a present reality. Bible assurance is to be gained through the daily working of the Holy Spirit within us. The earliest working is to be perceived by us and built upon and to go forward from there. Paul did not say, don't worry about it. If you're sincere, that's good enough. No. Nor did he belittle them and discourage them. He gave further teaching, and they received Christ and were baptized. And I think that is the answer to what happens here. I believe that they had a faith that was like the faith of some that you may know, some that we all know. They had a faith, but they didn't have Christ. They had not received Christ. Because if you do not know there's a Holy Spirit, if you don't know that He's come, then He's the one that bears witness of Christ. That's what He says. But Paul took them where they were and he gave them further instruction. The Holy Spirit always keeps sweet company with the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the Holy Spirit set his seal on the testimony of Jesus Christ, and he did it in them. As they received the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit put his seal on it. Yes, they had the Spirit now. And Paul saw it. He laid his hands on them. They spoke with other tongues. He gave the same, the same signs that were seen on the day of Pentecost. Now Paul sees it in them. He doesn't have to ask them, do you, have you received the Holy Spirit? The evidence was there. The Holy Spirit can be possessed in greater fullness by any believer. That is another truth that we need to keep in mind. I have the Holy Spirit. Should I pray for more of the Holy Spirit? Yes, yes, we should. Should I pray for more evidence, more of the power of the Spirit in my life? Absolutely. More surrender to Him? Yes, that's where, that's where it is, that I grieve not the Spirit of God, that He not withdraw from me. We know that can happen. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Spiritual life, spiritual understanding, a transformed character, a spirit of prayer, so that you're crying, Abba, Father. Christian, does your life manifest his gracious operation in you? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, meekness, temperance. Does he manifest grace in you? Does he manifest grace in me? I know that, as I said at the beginning, I'm not here to argue what Paul meant by the question, but I think this way of presenting the question makes sense for us. It certainly it's certainly something that we can say to ourselves and ask ourselves and others. Have you received the Holy Spirit? You say you believed. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Does Christ live in your heart by the Holy Spirit? And he will evidence himself. And we want him to more and more. We want our lives to be controlled by the Spirit of God.